well praise the living god and uh, i'm glad uh, for this hour that uh, through this means the lord can enable us to be able to share uh, in the messages uh, of the truth for this hour and uh, this is uh, number 16 in the presentation the prophets and the messengers and uh, we are looking at uh, our number that is uh, our number four in the an appeal to common sense and uh, we are going to look at the tithing system and what uh, the messenger had to say at her time and so i want to welcome us and uh, pray for me pray that uh, the network the network will be well and the equipment will work well otherwise let us pray and uh, just give thanks to the lord as we start the presentation of this hour yes. our dear god in heaven thank you for this uh, hour thank you for watching over us thank you for your presence always and uh, giving us another chance to share your word there are many who have slept, but Lord, you have given us uh, or extended our probation that we may serve you in thy vineyard. And so, educate us, and through me, may you speak to your people in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we are looking at uh, an appeal to common sense. And as I said, this is number 16 in the series, The Prophets and the Messengers. And this is number four in the same series. And we are looking at the tithing system. Now, there has been people who have been saying that the tithing system ought not to be. But, um, and uh, it was uh, an Old Testament thing. But I, I like us to to look at what is said in the New Testament as uh, we begin this presentation. Uh, Paul says, who goeth to the war uh, at his own expense? Who goeth to the war uh, at his own expense? And so let us look at the book of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 9. And I'll start from verse 1. I'm so glad to be presenting this. Paul says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Interesting, there are people who are doubting Paul and uh, they were doubting Paul and belittling his ministry. He says, Have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care of the oxen? And we shall be seeing this in a little bit. Or saith he, it altogether for our sakes, for our sakes no doubt this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope if we have sown unto you spiritual things is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things 
if others be partakers of this power over you are not we rather nevertheless we have not used this power but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of christ do you not know that uh, they that minister about holy things live of the things of the temple and they that which wait at the altar are partakers of partakers with the altar um even so that the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Uh, this is a very clear statement that should uh, tell us that uh, the system of tithing and offering is um, something that should not be neglected. For those who work on the altar, partake of the altar, and um, those who work for the gospel lives by the gospel. Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading. Where does Paul get that in the law? Where does Paul get that in the law? Thou shalt not muzzle. Uh, in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, uh, let me see the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verse 4. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth on the corn. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox. And so, the ministers who work by the gospel and uh, should live on the gospel. Again, in First Timothy chapter 5, he has this to say. Let uh, the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Double honor, it's not just a thank you, but also a pay that they should receive. For the scripture said, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. And uh, Ellen White saw the common sense in this, that um, if people abandon their work of uh, cultivating their gardens and i'm not saying that uh, any garden should remain bushy but if they dedicate all their life in spreading the gospel what do you think who sustains them paul says if we have sown among you spiritual things are, are we not um uh, are we not um, qualified for some uh, temporal benefits or carnal benefits. And so the messenger had this to talk about. How should the ministry be sustained and who qualifies? A pressing question during the 1850s was how to support the ministry. Ministers with families had a most difficult challenge when they had to rely on the liberality of believers, especially when few church groups were organized. Many could preach only on a part-time basis. The whites and the Bible, the whites sold Bibles and other books to supplement the little income they received from friends. Furthermore, the butter system often prevailed for money was scarce, especially in a largely agrarian society. In uh, late 1858, Ellen White told her husband that uh, the Lord had shown her that Jay and Andrew should come to Battle Creek Hold a Bible class, and in the study, they will develop a biblical plan for sustaining the ministry. In that Bible class held in January 1859, the leaders agreed that the tithing system is still binding, and uh, they suggested calling the program Systematic Benevolence on the Tithing Principle. On January 29, the Battle Creek congregation will unanimously at will. Um, on January 29, the Battle Creek congregation voted unanimously to adopt the program and uh, published the plan in the Review and Herald. The example of the Battle Creek Church set the pace for other churches to follow. By June, Miss White was writing that the plan of systematic benevolence is pleasing to God. In the early days of implementation, the plan did not separate tithes from offering and all was devoted to supporting the ministry. In January 1861, Ms. White wrote a candid message that more clearly defined the tithing principle. 
applying Malachi 3, 8 to 11 to present day obligations to the Lord. She delineated how the tithing principle was fair to all, the poor as well as to the wealthy, and that in the arrangement of systematic benevolence, hearts will be tested and proved. Here is a test for the naturally selfish and covetous. Ellen White said often that the tithe is sacred, reserved for God, preserved by God for himself. It is to be brought into the treasury to be used to sustain the gospel laborers in their work. Gospel laborers are defined as ministers and Bible instructors, Bible teachers in our educational institutions, minister physicians, retired gospel workers, and workers in a needy mission field in the North, in North America and abroad. God has blessed the tithing system. Now, she continues to say, the laborer is worth his pay, but are full time missionaries exempted from manual labor to sustain their families and fellow laborers. An appeal to common sense. You see, say an example that you are a minister and the people you are ministering are poor. And this is an appeal to common sense. Will you be expecting these people to give you enough to sustain your family when they are all so poor and they can't bring enough? And more so, this has been a problem when it comes to self-supporting ministries that they don't get tithe or offering from anyone, but uh, they have to open up churches. And uh, uh, most of the congregations, they are poor. What do they have to do for their living? And so an appeal to common sense, shall they not do any manual labor? We are living in the last days and the first fulfilling prophecies show that Christ Second coming is near. If there was a time for having an upper room experience and putting our efforts and means together as the disciples did during the time of early reign is now. The purpose of this document is to spur us to another height of benevolence and to know our duties as ministers and congreg congregants. Not only do we have to be laborers expecting help or working for the motive of reward, but we should be spending and expending ourselves for the purpose of reaching to a people living where light has not shone hence. In uh, Faith I Live By, page 160, paragraph 6, she has this to say. Uh, Our money has not been given us that we might honor and glorify ourselves. A faithful steward, as faithful stewards, we are to use it for the honor and glory of God. Something that only a portion of their means is the Lord's. When they have set apart a portion for religious and charitable purposes, they regard the remainder as their own, to be used as they see fit. But in this they mistake. All we possess is the Lord's, and we are accountable to him for the use we make of it. In the use of every penny, it will be seen whether we love God supremely and our neighbor as ourselves. Money has great value because it can do great good. In the hands of God's children, it is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, and clothing for the naked. But money is of no more value than sand, only as it is put to use in providing for the necessities of life, in blessing others, and advancing the cause of Christ. Let us read about a liberal church. In this first letter to the church of, at Corinth, Paul gave the believers instruction regarding the general principles underlying the support of God's work in the earth. Writing of his apostolic labors in their behalf, he inquired, Who goeth a uh, warfare any time at his own charges? Doth God take care for oxen, or saith he altogether for our sex? If we have sown spiritual things, the apostle further inquired, Is it a great thing if we shall reap you from you carnal things? And so, the prophetess expounding on this, she says that uh, this was to remind them of their obligations to the ministers uh, that were working amongst them. And so the apostle uh, in uh, the book of 1 Corinthians referred to the Lord's plan for maintenance of the priest who ministered in the temple, that those who work on the altar need to survive on the altar and those who work in the gospel need to survive on the gospel. Verily they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. 
and uh, that is a, uh, when you read uh, Deuteronomy 18:5 and uh, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 5. Now in uh, Acts of Apostle, look at the Acts of Apostle, and uh, I want to read a statement from uh, page uh, 336, paragraph 2. It was this plan for the support of the ministry that Paul referred when he said, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And later in writing to Timothy, the apostle said, The laborer is worthy of his reward. She continues to say, The payment of the tithe was but a part of God's plan for the support of his service. Numerous gifts and offerings were divinely specified. Under the Jewish system, the people were taught to cherish a spirit of liberality, both in sustaining the cause of God and in supplying the wants of the needy. For special occasions, they were free will offerings. At the harvest and the vintage, the first fruits of the field, corn, wine, and oil were consecrated as an offering to the Lord. The gleanings and the corners of the field were reserved for the poor. The first fruits of the wool when the sheep was shorn of the grain when the wheat was threshed were set apart for God. So also were the firstborn of all animals and a redemption price was paid for the firstborn son. The first fruits were to be presented before the Lord at the sanctuary and were then devoted to the use of the priest. But this system of the benevolent, the Lord sought to teach Israel that in everything he must be first. And so... We must know that uh, God has blessed us not um, to hold wealth and uh, enrich ourselves at the expense of the gospel or uh, to enter into the gospel for the benefit of reaping money from the people. But uh, our motivation for the gospel should be uh, winning souls to Christ, whether they tithe or whether they not tithe, but the congregation have an obligation of knowing that uh, once a person has been called, I'm not saying the person has called themselves, but has been called by God, then they have a duty to make sure that this person is sustained. It is not God's purpose that Christians whose privileges far exceed those of the Jewish nation shall give less freely than they gave. So unto um, whomsoever much is given, the Savior declared in Luke 12, 48, much is also required. The liberalities required of the Hebrews, if you look at it, was largely to benefit their own nation. Today, the work of God extends over all the earth, and in the hands of his followers, Christ has placed the treasures of the gospel, and upon them he has laid the responsibility of giving the glad tidings of the salvation to the world. And the church and the congregation have an obligation to make sure that this work does not stagnate, but it continues going forward. And so as the fields uh, are open and the work extends all over the world, there will be more close call of means. But then look at uh, how the sanctuary itself was built. The Lord did not force anyone to bring the offerings to build the sanctuary. He only accepts free will offering. Offerings which has been brought to the altar of God with tears, God does not accept them. You pollute my altar with tears. People give while murmuring. People give while questioning everything. And people give while suspecting everyone that uh, they are giving unto. And sometimes they are justified because there are many thieves that uh, are uh, masquerading as preachers. And so you find that there's a lot of scrutiny when somebody is giving their money or their penny, which I, I, I'm not uh, really complaining. But then God does not allow offerings that are mingled with the tears of men where they have to complain while they are giving. And so when the fields extend, you won't expect that uh, less will be required of the people, but much more as we see uh, the end coming. For the Lord says that... Uh, um, where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. And he tells us to store our wealth in heaven where the canker worms and the caterpillars cannot reach and the great reward that awaits for those who have sustained the field. So the, the problem has the, been that men are tempted to use their means in self-indulgence. They, and they can give every reason for not giving what they have. You hear people say that no one is worthy it. 
uh, no one is uh, converted yet to be able to receive what I have. And uh, a, a lot of things that uh, the, 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 all the, the, the earth is cast and uh, no one is fit to be uh, given uh, any money to do any work. But then as people continue really putting on these sentiments, the Lord is saying, I have reserved 7,000 who have not bowed down to Baal. In as much as it is seen that there is no Christian today who is worthy to receive tithe and offering to do the work of God, God himself, you know, we go beyond what God has revealed unto us and then start measuring men on the balances of our own scales. And so men will use the money of God to do everything and anything they want and give excuses and they are robbing God. It doesn't matter what you are doing. We are told, for the objects many churches members do not hesitate to spend freely and even extravagantly. But when asked to give to the Lord's treasury to carry forward his work in the earth, they demand and murmur, perhaps feeling that they cannot well do otherwise. They dole out a sum of smaller than they often spend for needless indulgence. And then uh, there is a statement that Sister White makes in uh, Acts of Apostle, page 338, paragraph 3 that he whose heart is aglow with the love of Christ will regard it as not only a duty, but a pleasure to aid in the advancement of the highest, holiest work committed to man, the work of presenting to the world the riches of good, goodness, mercy, and truth. And uh, there is uh, another statement that she makes that uh, I love us also to hear. I think it should be either in the Ministry of Healing, um, in a little while, I'll be able to show you either Christ Object Lesson or Minister of Healing. That is uh, in Christ Object Lesson, not Minister of Healing. Page, uh, uh, page, uh, page, uh, page uh, 384, paragraph 2. Christ Object Lesson, page 384, paragraph 2. This tithing system is a means to develop the character. She says, love is the basis of godliness. Whatever the profession, no man has pure love to God unless he has unselfish love for his brother. But we can never come into possession of this spirit by trying to love others. What is needed is the love of Christ in the heart. When self is merged in Christ, love springs forth spontaneously. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. When the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in the countenance. And then, uh, uh, the poor shall not cease to be amongst you. The poor, consideration of the poor. This arrangement did not, however, wholly do away with poverty. It was not God's purpose that poverty should wholly cease. It is one of the means for the development of character. The poor, he says, shall never cease out of the land. Therefore, I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brethren, brother, to thy poor and to thy needy in thy land. This system of benevolence really develops character. And so it is one of the means that God keeps in check what we call selfishness. And so uh, the spirit of liberality is the spirit of heaven, she says in uh, Acts of Apostles, page 339. The spirit finds it is highest manifestation in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And you remember John 3.16 that... Um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, think about that for a second, that uh, God gave all heaven head for the sake of humanity. And he was willing to lose his son so that humanity may be saved. But then we decry even the smallest thing we give. You, you know, this, this tithes and offering we give are um, the treasures of God. God, without giving us on oxygen, we will never work with our hands and get the treasures we have. And yet just to take a portion of it and remit back to him for the saving of souls while he gave everything for his son, 
it seems a calamitous thing unto us. We think that it, it God is robbing us when we are really actually robbing God. And so, uh, in uh, AA340 paragraph 1, I, I like to project something so that uh, we may read together uh, in AA. He says, God's chosen messengers who are engaged in aggressive labor should never be compelled to go a warfare at their own charges, unaided by the sympathetic and heavy support and heart support of their brethren. It is the part of the church members to deal liberally with those who lay aside their secular employment that they may give themselves to the ministry. When God's ministers are encouraged, his cause is greatly advanced. But when through the selfishness of men, their rightful support is withheld, their hands are weakened and often their usefulness is seriously crippled. The displeasure of God kindled against those who claim to be his followers, yet allow consecrated workers to suffer for the necessities of life while engaged in active ministry. I'll repeat again. The displeasure of God is kindled against those who claim to be his followers, yet allow consecrated workers to suffer for the necessities of life while engaged in active ministry. These selfish ones will be called to render an account not only for the misuse of their Lord's money, but for the depression and heartache which their cause has brought upon his faithful servants. Those who are called to the work of the ministry and at the call of duty give up all to engage in God's service should receive for their self-sacrificing efforts wages sufficient to support themselves and their families. Now, I'm presenting not uh, not presenting this so that um, tithes and offerings may be channeled unto me. I, I, I do not wish that for a moment. There are proper channels to do that, and um, gospel order should be implemented and through organizations so that uh, not one person is receiving too much and another one is suffering while they are doing the work equally the same, and even the other one is doing a very important work than the other one. So gospel order organization should be implemented so that uh, there may be fair distribution of uh, support of the work. And so those who complain that uh, it is too much to give unto the vineyard of the Lord will realize too late that they are holding that which could have been used to advance the cause of God and withholding it, they are really supporting the enemy of souls for to hurry the people in perdition without sharing the gospel truth. Um, that there may be funds in the treasury for the support of the ministry and to meet the calls for assistance in missionary enterprises, it is necessary that the people of God give cheerfully and liberally. God uh, 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 blesses a cheerful giver. Even in uh, 341 paragraph 3 of uh, uh, Acts of Apostle, this is uh, what she has to say. That um, even the very poor should bring their offerings to God. They are to be sharers of the grace of Christ by denying self to help those whose need is more pressing than their own. The poor man's gift, the fruit of self-denial, comes up before God as a fragrant incense. And every act of self-sacrifice strengthens the spirit of beneficence in the giver's heart, allowing him more closely to the one who was rich, yet for our sake became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be rich. And so even the poor are not exempted. And uh, in the book of Numbers, I hope to get uh, this, just uh, by the way, as we continue on this, an appeal to common sense that uh, if people are doing gospel work, they need to be sustained by the altar or by the gospel. Uh, in the book of Numbers, there is a statement I just uh, want to look at in passing by. Uh, the book of Numbers. Now, 
in numbers chapter 4 you i want you to see some statement here numbers chapter 4 numbers chapter 4 verses 3 and uh, there is another verse i'll be able to read unto you from 30 years old and upward until 50 years old all that enter into the host do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation and then in numbers 423 from that 30 years old and upward until 50 years old the all shall thou number them all that enter into perform the service uh, of the congregation again. And then there is uh, a statement that she makes that these old people They when they reach um yes, this is the statement numbers eight twenty-five. Now I want you to see this. It's a very interesting statement in Numbers chapter eight, and I'll just highlight it for some clarity. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is it that belongeth unto the Levites from twenty and Five years old and upward, they shall go in to wait upon the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. And from the age of 50 years, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof and shall serve no more, but shall minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep the charge and shall do no service. Thus shall thou do unto the Levites touching their charge. Now look at thou shall do unto the Levites touching their charge. And so it was that time. Um, after they had reached the age of 50, they will cease serving, but they will be there at the tabernacle to instruct the other younger Levites. And they shall not cease to receive their wages, even though they had ceased from active labor, labor and they were there as instructors. What am I saying? There are people who have been zealous in the work of God and have done their duty while they still had energy and they were young. And now they have reached the age of 50 and 60 and they have retired from active service, but they can be called upon to counsel and instruct the church in the way forward in evangelism. We are told tithes should be given unto them, even though they are retired soldiers, even though they are retired servants, that they sh you should not diminish their, 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 their wages for when they were young, they devoted everything to the Lord and they did not go into the world to work and save for their future when they had grown old. And now that they are old, they need more of your support than even when they had still energy to work for themselves. And so ministers who have been working among us and they have reached the age of 50 and 60 and they, they have retired from active, active service, we should not say that now your work is over you cannot receive the tithes, and that is it. But they should be cared for, even as the Bible says, and uh, we shall be dealing with the issue more closely when we deal with the series tithes and offering. And so the Lord says that um, it doesn't matter how much your offering or your tithe is small. In uh, Mark chapter 12, verse 44, Christ uh, calls to attention uh, the disciples to this woman who had, who had given all her living. She had given the two mites, all that she had, into the treasure. She didn't give out of the abundance she had, but she gave out of the heart that she had. And so it shouldn't be seen that whoever is giving a million dollars is more worthy than the one who is giving one dollar. All are equal in the eyes of the Lord. One has given out of the abundance. Another one has given out of what she had and out of her heart. And so in the eyes of the Lord, tithes, there is no one who gives so much. There is no one who gives so little. It is a tense of what you have. And a tense is a tense 
whether it be millions or whether it be uh, a few coins. And so uh, the widow who gave was com uh, commended for the two mites, just as when you shall give millions, you shall be uh, uh, seen worth it to. And so no one should feel that uh, what I have is so insignificant in the hands of the Lord, in the eyes of the Lord. The Lord takes out of the willing heart that which he has given you and us, and he has never um, requested for that which he has not blessed you with. Now, <clears throat> an example of Paul as the minister of God. The Apostle Peter, Paul, uh, I mean the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul in his ministry among the churches was untiring in his efforts to inspire in the hearts of the new converts a desire to do large things for the cause of God. Often he exhorted them to the exercise of liberality and uh, he talked so much of the church of um, Achaia and the Macedonian church. And he told the other churches that out of their poverty, they were willing to give all that they had. First of all, they gave themselves, which was the most important thing. They gave themselves, then they gave all their means. And he tells them that he who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. If you read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Nearly all the Macedonian believers were poor in this world's goods, but their hearts were overflowing with love for God and his truth. And they gladly gave for the support of the gospel. When general collections were taken up in the Galilee churches for the relief of the Jewish believers, the liberality of the converts in Macedonia was held up as an example to other churches. And so no church in the land ought to say we are not, we are so poor and we can support the gospel work. Well. We are told that the willingness to sacrifice on the part of the Macedonian believers came as a result of wholehearted consecration. And so when the hearts of men and women are consecrated to the service of the Lord, actually you shall see one by giving themselves and two by the willingness to sacrifice their substance for the saving of souls in other regions. Um, and uh, unselfish liberality threw the early church into a transport of joy. For the believers knew that their efforts were helping to send the gospel message to those in darkness. Their benevolence testified that they had not received the grace of God in vain. What could produce such a liberality by the sanctification of the spirit? In the eyes of believers and unbelievers, it was a miracle of grace. Spiritual prosperity is closely bound up in Christian liberality. Where you find that uh, people are so hard to give themselves in substance, uh, it will be from uh, a heart which is not consecrated, a heart which is not wholly given unto the Lord. Now, the Tithes and offering and the benevolent fund have not been presented in uh, a proper way and then uh, it has been not dealt with good with the members. And so instead of people appealing to the conversion of the hearts, there has been an appeal on money more than an appeal to the hearts of the people. When the people are converted, Giving is not a problem unto them. But when people are not converted, there becomes a problem in giving. And so Sister White saw this issue and uh, she had something to say in uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page 237, Paragraph 2. She had to say something about praised offerings. And uh, I'd like us to read together and uh, be benefited together about praised offerings. Ministers have stood directly in the way of the work of God in Ohio. They should stand out of the way that God may reach his people. They step in between God and his people and turn aside his purposes. Brother Jay has exerted an influence in Ohio, which he must labor to counteract. I saw that um, there were those in Ohio who will take the right position with right instructions. 
They have been willing to sustain the cause of present truth, but have seen so little accomplished that they have become discouraged. Their hands are feeble and need staying up. I saw that the cause of God is not to be carried forward by praised offerings. God does not accept such offerings. This matter is to be left holy by the people. They are not to bring a yearly gift merely, but should also freely present a weekly and monthly offering before the Lord. This work is left to the people, for it is to be to them a weekly, monthly living test. This tithing system I saw will develop character and manifest the true state of the heart. If the brethren in Ohio have this matter presented before them in its true bearing, and are left to decide for themselves, they will see wisdom and order in the tithing system. Ministers should not be severe and draw upon any one man and press means from him. If he does not give just as much as another thinks he should, they are not to denounce him and throw him overboard. They should be as patient and forbearing as the angels are. They should work in union with Jesus. Christ and angels are watching the development of character and weighing moral worth. The Lord bears long with his erring people. The truth will be brought to here to bear closer and closer and will cut off one idol after another until God reigns supreme in the hearts of his consecrated people. I saw that God's people must bring to him a free will offering and the responsibility should be left wholly upon the individual whether he will give much or little. It will be faithfully recorded. Give the people of God time to develop character. Those who will gain the blessing of sanctification must first learn the meaning of self-sacrifice. The cross of Christ is the central pillar on which hangs the far more exceeding and eternal weights of glory. If any man will come after me, Christ says, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, Matthew 16, 24. It is the fragrance of our love for our fellow men that reveals our love for God. It is patience in service that brings rest to the soul. It is through humble, diligent, faithful toil that the welfare of Israel is promoted. God upholds and strengthens the one who is willing to follow in Christ's way. Now, I want, you, I want us to revisit this. Give the people of God time to develop character. If character is developed, Actually, the offerings will flow in freely. We do not need to press people to give their tithes and offering. We need to lay bare unto them their obligations and live upon them and not press them because God does not accept pressed offerings. Once the hearts are converted, once we show people the cross of Jesus and the salvation of fellow men and the need to be partakers of the sufferings of Christ in reaching the souls which are in darkness, it will melt the hearts of the people. And then it will be left unto them to decide what they shall do with their money. And uh, uh, we shall be coming on the parts of vows. And uh, if you vow and if you promise that we'll bring something, what uh, actually people start depending on that thing and they make plans based on your promises. And so if you fail, actually, you make the people who have also been acting faithfully from your promise to look like liars in the eyes of the people. Take an example that uh, a needy case comes unto me and says, brother, I wish you to help me in this and this. Let us say this is a widow and uh, the roof is going down. There's so much rain in their house. And uh, it seems that uh, she doesn't have a place to sleep. And she says, brother, you see how my house looks like. I need your help. And you, you, you tell the widow, please, I do not have money for now. And then uh, you start praying about it. And uh, as you pray about it, a brother or a sister tells you, you know what? I'm going to help you do something uh, through your work. And then you remember the widow and you go back and tell the widow, you know, I have been praying and the Lord has opened ways. And uh, at the end of the month, I'll be able to help you with even one iron sheet or two iron sheets. And then it comes the end, man, end months where you are, were promised and whoever had promised to give you some help fails to give you. And then you start looking a liar to this widow. 
And we are told that those who make vows should honor them less actually God becomes angry with them. Uh, again, those who will gain the blessing of sanctification must first learn the meaning of self-sacrifice. So the system of tithing and offering and benevolence brings about sanctification. What is sanctification? That is being made whole or being set apart uh, for a holy use. And so as God sees that uh, we are ready to empty ourselves, empty everything, both uh, um, in sustaining the gospel and being used in the gospel field, uh, our life is sanctified and uh, he is able to use us as uh, his, we are set apart uh, as his holy vessels. Now, in the days of Israel, the tithe and free will offerings were needed to maintain the ordinances of divine service. Should the people of God give less in this age, the principle laid down by Christ is that our offerings to God should be in proportion of, to the light and privileges enjoyed. And to whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. Freely you have received, freely give. Matthew 10, 8. As our blessings and privileges are increased above all, as we have before as the unparalleled sacrifice of the glorious Son of God, should not our gratitude find the expression in more abundant gifts to extend to others the message of salvation? The work of the gospel as it widens requires greater provision to sustain it than was called for anciently. And this makes the law of tithes and offering of even more urgent necessity now than under the Hebrew economy. If uh, his people were liberal to sustain his cause by their voluntary gifts, instead of resorting to unchristian and unhallowed methods to fill the treasury, God will be honored and many more souls will be won to Christ. That is Patriarchs and Prophets, page 528, paragraph 4. Now, as we bring this to a close, the plan of Moses to raise means for the building of the tabernacle was highly successful. No urging was necessary, nor did he employ any of the devices to which churches in our day so often resort. He made no grand feast. He did not invite the people to scenes of gaiety, dancing, and general amusement, neither did he institute lotteries, nor anything of this profane order to obtain means to erect the tabernacle of God. The Lord directed Moses to invite the children of Israel to bring their offerings. He was to accept gifts from everyone that gave willingly from his heart. PP 529. God has made men his stewards. The property which he has placed in their hands is the means that he has provided for the spread of the gospel. To those who prove themselves faithful stewards, he will commit greater trust. Said the Lord, them that honor me, I'll, I will honor. 1 Samuel 2, 30, God loveth a cheerful giver, and when his people with grateful hearts bring their gifts and offerings to him, not grudgingly or of necessity, his blessings will attend them as he has promised, bringing all the tithes and into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. In uh, 3408 paragraph 3, E.G. White says this, God calls for talents in of influence and of means. Shall we refuse to obey? Our Heavenly Father bestows gifts and solicits a portion back that he may test us whether we are worthy to have the gift of everlasting life. Again, she says, I was shown that uh, there have been unhappy results from making urgent calls for means at our camp meetings. And uh, that is why you find that uh, many times we don't do these committing offerings because people go out of this committing thinking that you have come to do business. When you tell them, you see, you are eating, you are sleeping, and the building that you are using have been hired. Why don't you be liberal in giving your offerings and tithes to sustain this work? And you hear people say, oh, so you people, you are selling the gospel. Sometimes people lack common sense, actually. That is why we are appealing to common sense. Here you are being sustained in a certain school or a, a certain conference hall. 
you are using electricity of somebody, you are using the beddings of somebody, and you are being fed, and you can have an audacity of saying, uh, when you are called upon to give something for the sustenance of the work that uh, people are selling gospel. You know, sometimes we look at these things and then may God give us a heart filled with this because sometimes the devil have ways of provoking ministers uh, through the members of the church. And so we are told that this calling for means in our camp meetings leaves a bad impression upon the people. And the people should use common sense that the Bible has said, thou shalt not appear before the Lord with an empty hand. Now, people will tell you, okay, we, we don't have money. It, it's understandable. The economy is harsh. We, we don't have money. And let us just uh, re remain at that point that um, there are people who cannot have some money to bring to the camp meetings. I was shown that there have been unhappy results from making urgent calls for means at our camp meetings. This matter has been pressed too hard. Many men of means would not have done anything had not their hearts been softened and melted under the influence of testimonies born to them. Now look at this. But the poor have been deeply affected and in the sincerity of souls have pledged means which they had a heart to give but which they were not, unable to pay. In most instances, urgent calls for means have left a wrong impression upon some minds. Some have thought that money was the burden of our message. Many have gone to their homes blessed because they had donated to the cause of God. But there are better methods of raising means by free will offerings than by urgent calls at our large gatherings. If all come to if all come up to the plan of systematic benevolence, and if our tract and missionary workers are faithful in their department of work of the work, the treasury will be well supplied without these urgent calls at our large gatherings. So she says, We have poor people among us. When we make urgent calls in the camp meeting, it really affects them because they see, you see, we are the ones who are being targeted. And really, they don't have anything to give. But when you announce that you need money, actually, they are affected so much. And so she says that it were better if these things could have been resolved earlier so that when you come to the camp meeting, the sole purpose of that meeting is to spreading the truth and comforting the people of God. And those who are able and are using common sense and they have the money, they can ask the ministers and uh, those who are prepared to come, is there any need that you you people you, you, you want? Is there any place that is suffering so that uh, we may see how to help each other? But this urgent going to the pulpit and urging money, urging money in the midst of messages throws people off the cliff and they cannot be blessed with the messages that are being presented. And so we should uh, really reform and be converted the way we uh, conduct our camp meetings. Let us collect money beforehand. And then when the meeting is there, let the people be blessed with the message. And uh, if there is not enough food, See how you can be able to go beyond your own pockets to get money to supply the food for the people, but then appealing for the means in the camp meetings, urgent appeals for the money is not the best thing. The prophetess says this is not the thing that should be going on in our camp meetings. And so we, we can learn from each other and uh, prepare earlier so that uh, we may not be a stumbling block to those who have come to receive Christ in our camp meetings. Let us plan things earlier. Whoever you are, whether it is uh, our ministry or other ministries or other churches, that uh, we can do things as early as possible. And uh, I thank the Lord that uh, uh, the issue of money has not been so much uh, uh, when uh, uh, we are having these meetings and uh, the ministers have kept the goal uh, uh, as the burden of uh, the meeting being uh, uh, appealing to the people to give their hearts to Christ rather than appealing for money. And so uh, the laborer is worth his pay. And so let everyone ask themselves where they are. What am I doing to make sure that the gospel go forth? You know, through somebody, I was saved. 
This is what I mean. Somebody gave their money that the message may reach me. Whether it be through a book, whether it be through an open air meeting, whether it be through a door to door evangelism. Somebody sustained a certain minister for somebody to get into salvation. And now, because somebody sustained someone for you to get into the truth, don't you see the need also of you being a means to somebody being reached somewhere? And so, funds are indispensable. Men must eat, drink, and wear. Who will bear the burden? And uh, I want to read this statement in closing because it's a wonderful statement to read from. And uh, it comes from it comes from uh, Adventist Review, Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, March 11, 1858, page 129. Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, March 11, 1858, page 129. I want to read this statement as we close. I said this, we are bringing an end to this, and we have to read The Laborer is Worth His Pay and see how our pioneers and the messenger of the Lord had to reason, an appeal to common sense. Are we all awake in Ohio? The work in this state is begun, and you can put there the name of your conference, the name of your church, or your name yourself. The tent meeting held last season in Gilboa has been the means of spreading the truth far and wide. And the efforts of the messenger since have been attended with a blessing, but shall the work stop here? Shall not the loud cry still ring in the ears of these people until all are warned of the impending storm? Certainly, says every saint, Amen, let all hear. And then, how shall it be done? Funds are indispensable. Men must eat, drink, and wear. Who will bear the burden? Shall eight or ten or twenty persons have all the burden to bear? A tent should be well manned, three or four preachers, and at least two good able-bodied and devoted men with the exclusive care of the ten, and these men should be well supplied with needful aid and their families comfortably provided for at home, so that all anxiety on that score may be removed from their minds. Then they can labor gladly and cheerfully. How must a man feel? I want you to listen to this statement. How must a man feel? 50 miles from home with a letter in his pocket from his wife stating that the mailbox is empty and the children's shoes worn out as he arrives as he rises to preach and thinks of the bleeding cause of his master the impending storm that awaits a heartless world listen again how must a man feel 50 miles from home with a letter in his pocket from his wife stating that the mailbox is empty and the children's shoes worn out as he rises to preach and thinks of the bleeding cause of his master, the impending storm that awaits a heartless world. And then as his mind wanders to the hungry, scant cladded dear ones at home, for he loves his family, what an effort of his faith to present the truth. So here is a man miles away from home and he receives a letter the wife is saying you know husband we don't have anything the children's shoes are worn out and even some are out of school and this man is in the field working for god as even a businessman is at his work doing his business when this man rises to preach with this letter in his pocket how easy is he is it for him to preach? Let us hear what the quote continues to say. How his mind wanders from the subject, but says one, a rich one too. An elder must be willing to endure hardness. You just listen. And these are not far-fetched things. These are things that the pioneers felt. This is a man having a letter in his pocket, the family doesn't have anything. And a rich man says about that man who has a letter in his pocket and his family in one, an elder must endure hardness. Now listen to what uh, we are told in this letter. 
Let an elder trust in God and go out and God will take care of him. This man said, so he will. Now this is a response. So he will, dear man, when you and the like of you wail and lament. Yes, God will take care of those faithful ones who endure for his sake when the vials of his wrath fall upon the rich man. Now is the time for rich men to become poor if it is not already too late. Now, now we'll sell off those acres, some of those colts, those fine cattle, now that extra farm. Soon it will be too late. Soon he will throw the silver and gold in the streets. Perhaps there is yet time to lay it up in heaven. Perhaps must will linger a little longer. Let us make the case our own. How would a farmer feel with only a week's provision in the house, only 50 pounds of hay in the barn, only one suit of clothes? Now she says, or the writer says, one of the pioneers in the present truth has traveled 300 miles on four cents, has slept in barns and beneath his buggy while publishing the truth. Who is accountable for this? Certainly those whom God has made stewards of his treasure, those who are heaping up treasure for the la last days. But says, A, hey, I must reserve land for my son. Stop, dear brother. Think a moment. The 2300 days have closed. The angel up upon sea and land has sworn to the close of time. Mercy lingers a moment, and how precious this moment. Seize the golden opportunity. Make the heart of Christ glad with your offerings. Make the angels smile with their sacrifices, while plenty and peace fill the hearts and homes of these his chosen messengers. A peaceful conscience and a contented mind are the principal elements of happiness. The cross of Christ and the promise of God are designed to produce this and no Christian should rest short of them. And so when we think about these things, we ask ourselves, why should we be holding the, the means which we have? And so when a man leaves home for the missionary field and his work is not appreciated and the wife and the children are left hungry and with worn out shoes, the family takes preaching as a curse. And, uh, you know, people say the preaching, uh, the preaching is for the people who are not learning. But far be it that somebody can reason like that. Preaching is not for the unlearned. We are told study to show yourself an approved workmanship, rightly dividing the word of world that need not to be ashamed about it. And so we shall continue exploring this topic of uh, an appeal to common sense. If people are working in the vineyard of God, don't we have the masses to show them by our liberal uh, offerings and tithe? And so uh, I know this is a hard teaching, one that uh, somebody can feel that, oh, maybe it is presented because somebody has an interest in that, in, in this and that, but uh, it was just to bring unto us some things that uh, the messenger speaks to us, even as we are living in these last days. Bre brothers and sisters, we are in times when actually our wealth will mean nothing in a little while. Why don't we store it where it will be worthy to be uh, remembered of that, uh, you know, God says, welcome, thou good servant, well done. Why? Because you gave for others to be saved in the kingdom of God. And so may the Lord bless us. And um, how I pray that, um, first of all, we shall not bring our money. That is not the, the issue at stake. The first thing is that we shall give our hearts. When we have given our hearts, then the Lord shall make a way of giving us means to be able to give to his faith. I want to close with this verse. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse, from verse 23. Proverbs 11, 23. This is our last verse for this portion. The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be, be watered also himself. 
He that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him, but blessings shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor, but he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. And so may the Lord bless us and may God continue guiding us as we continue working in his vineyard and sustaining those who have left everything to minister to the souls which are in darkness. And shall we pray in now uh, closing thank you heavenly father and thank you for the messages you have for us it starts with me it goes to their church and to your people that uh, first of all we must be converted when our hearts are converted giving shall be seen blessed be thy name and uh, as we this, see the signs approaching the world history closing lord help us to be liberal in our hearts for speeding the message that has to go to the four corners of the world. Glory and honor be unto thee, in Jesus' name. Amen. May the good Lord keep you and bless you both with spiritual and physical blessings. Bye for now.